good morning. It's a glorious morning. We woke up, got up, and started the adventures of a new day. Welcome to our worship service at the First Unitarian Society of Ithaca, a community that reaches for connection, even while distanced, digs deep for inspiration in uncertain times, and strives to engage with a complex and uncertain world as we work to shepherd our community through this time of physical distancing. My name is Jens Wenberg, and I'm the Celebration Associate. Thank you so much for, enjoy, for joining us. We welcome everyone, whether you're a newcomer or longtime attendee, member of the Ithaca community, or watching us from afar. We are delighted that you've chosen to worship with us today. Our theme this month is deep listening. Be sure to check your email, our Facebook page, and our website for more information about how to create connections. If you'd like to receive weekly updates describing opportunities for engagement, please email a request to office at uuithaca.org. Our Standing on the Side of Love collection continues. During October, we are collecting maxi pads, tampons, and reusable and disposable menstrual cups. They can be dropped off on the church porch or picked up. See the weekly announcement for details. A special reminder, early voting has started. You can vote today until 2 p.m., tomorrow from 7 to 3, and on subsequent days. In addition to the presidential ballot, you can help select our congressional representative, state senators, and state representative. Our service this morning has been pre-recorded, but we look forward to sharing the service broadcast Sunday morning and seeing you at the live coffee hour that follows. Today, may we open our ears to the sounds of love and power. May we open our hearts to the longings of another. May we open our mouths to speak truth. May we open our minds to understand in a new way. Today, may we open our whole being to that which may call us to our best selves. Whoever you are, whoever you love, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Here you belong. The flaming chalice is the symbol of artists and activists, mystics and heretics, reformers and refugees and Unitarian Universalists everywhere. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth and the energy of action.
Good morning, friends. This morning, we are going to talk about how we listen to our elders and those who have come before us. Our faith reminds us that listening to people is important, so much so that we've put it in the second of our new sources. Words and deeds of prophetic people which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. But it's not just prophetic people. It's also wise people. Our faith tells us that some of the wisest people are older people, or as our faith calls them, elders. They have many years of life experience. Listening to their many journeys can help us navigate our own. Here is a candle. We light a candle in remembrance of those who have died. For us to use, late October can be a time for remembering those who have passed on recently and a long time ago. UUs are not the only ones who use this time of year to think about those who've died. For instance, Halloween was born from Samhain, an ancient pagan holiday, when the boundary between the living and the dead grows thin. And the Day of the Dead is a Mexican holiday, celebrated throughout Mexico and Mexican communities in the United States to remember and honor ancestors who have died. Remembering those who have died is a way of listening to and letting their voices live on. It's a way of saying, their light never fully goes out. That's part of why we light candles like this. When we offer a memorial service to someone who has died, we often share stories about how that person lived their life. These stories can be sad, and they can also be joyous or moving. We listen to their stories and learn how to live our own lives in a better way, in honor of the person who has died. We also remember special things about that person. All right, go ahead and grab your packet, mark 1025, and open it up. What'd you find inside? It's a small glass stone. When Reverend Margaret holds memorials here at Fusit or in other locations, she talks about the ripples that people leave in our lives. That may be a single thing they said or did that ripples out and resonates with us still. Then she drops a glass stone in water to be an example of this and invites people forward to share their stories of how the person that they lost created ripples in their own life. Can you think of someone in your life who has created ripples? This could be someone who has died or someone with us still. We will all lose someone eventually. This is a natural part of life. Listening deeply to each other helps by sharing the universal experience of loss. It helps us to know that we are not alone, just as you are not alone, even now when it can feel like this physical separation will never end. In times of joy and times of loss, we are here with you. Each week we create a space in our worship together as a communal spiritual practice. We lift up the names and circumstances that call for our joy and our celebration and for our concern and sorrow. If you're watching this service in its live format, I invite you to type your joy or your sorrow into the chat box. Or if you wish, you can speak your joy or your sorrow to the people who you're watching with or aloud to yourself. This morning, I lift up Amelia Habicht and her family as they mourn the loss of Oliver a few weeks ago. His service will be, will be, uh, will celebrate his life on October 31st. Information will be in the announce. And I also lift up Delva Headland, whose memorial service was held yesterday as we celebrated his life and his impact on the world. I lift up all those in our community who are in pain, all those who are struggling with this pandemic time. I lift up all of us as we make our way forward. Together, may we trust that these joys and these sorrows are held by the universe. And may we offer our love and compassion so that they may be held with care. At the beginning of our live coffee hour each week, we will have a facilitator who will offer space for the sharing of joys and sorrows. May all that engage in the communal spiritual practice of listening deeply 
offering our care and compassion to one another. May we do so particularly during this challenging time. Now holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows of our lives, let us continue in some moments of reflection and prayer. I offer these words by my colleague, Reverend Joe Cherry. It's called A Prayer for the Listeners. When my ears are full of the worries, the concerns, the pains of others, grant me permission for silence. When my arms and shoulders and back ache from the burdens of others, grant me permission to set them down. Guide me to another, a friend perhaps to talk with, not for once to be talked at. And may I not be a burden to them as I pour out my pain, my weariness, my exhaustion, but a place, a space of mutual care. My listener friend, may you always know, no matter how tired I am, you can turn to me too. So may it be. Amen. And blessed be. This week, we will be singing all three verses of Winds Be Still. If you've been joining us all month, we have been singing one verse each week and really sinking into it. And now we're ready to hear the whole thing all together. Each week, we take an offering to sustain the important ministries and programs of this congregation and its presence in Ithaca. May these gifts bring about connection, inspiration, and engagement within these walls and beyond.
there is a Cherokee story about two wolves. It serves as an excellent parable for us. It goes something like this. One evening, an elderly Cherokee brave told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, ego. The other wolf is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. In the Hebrew Bible, there are two creation stories. One focuses on the creation of human beings, you know, the Adam and Eve and all of that. And the other creation story in the Hebrew Bible focuses on creating order from chaos. In that story, God sees the chaos of the world and separates the water from the land, the light from the darkness, and so on. Now the earth was a formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, it says in the Genesis story, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. It seems like a lot of work, tidying the world from this formless void. You gotta start somewhere, and you might as well start with turning on the light, which was what God did. And after separating light from darkness in this creation story, God goes on to create day and night, the sky, plants, the sun, and the moon, to illuminate the sky and mark the day and night. God created creatures for the sea and on land, and finally, humankind. In the end, in this creation story, God rests on the seventh day because God had a busy week creating the world. And in this creation story, the world begins as this chaotic and formless void. And so God, God starts doing some sorting, some decluttering, some organizing. And by the end of the week, we have a world that is full of categories and names, and it is all labeled as good. Maybe this story helps us learn something about our human desire to have things neat and orderly and tidy whether it's literally having our things in order or knowing concretely when something is right or wrong. As humans, we want to know if something is good or not. Throughout our lives, we're taught what is good and what is bad, sometimes overtly and sometimes by implication or association. And sometimes it is very clear that something is good or bad but sometimes we just get this feeling deep in our tummy that tells us something feels right or wrong. We want to believe we have control over how we see the world. We want to believe that we can always choose which of the wolves inside us we will feed. We want to believe that we can always choose to be good. But the reality of human behavior is that we are impacted by ideas and biases that are beyond our control. And in order to shift that reality, we must increase our awareness. One of the concepts that is increasing in understanding these days in recent years is this idea of implicit bias. Implicit bias is the idea that we categorize things, people, ideas, as good or bad, based solely on how we've been socialized and taught. Implicit bias doesn't care if you've read the books or have the best intentions. 
Implicit bias exists because it's in the marrow of who we are and who we have been socialized to be as a culture. The socialization starts from when we are our youngest selves. Which stories are we exposed to? What messages do we receive from the media that we consume? How are our ideas about people who look or behave different from us shaped by the people we interact with and the messages we receive about them? All of these things impact our implicit associations and biases and subconsciously impact how we see the world. There's an online test created at Harvard University that you can take and it rates the level of implicit association and bias you have with race. They have it for many other ideas, but race is one of them. And the test includes these words that are either good, words like love, friendship, happy, or bad, anger, resentment, jealousy. And then it shows you faces of white people and black people. And throughout the test, you're asked to choose how to label the words and the people separately, then together, as quickly as you can. And halfway through the test, the categories change, you have to adjust. Inevitably, there comes a time when you will get a wrong answer. And this points out the tendency toward implicit bias for or against a certain race of people in this case. Now, if you participate in the Living the Pledge program here at FUSIT, which is kicking off next month, I hope all of you will, you'll have the chance to take the test. And through that program, you'll learn more about how implicit bias exists and how we can work toward challenging it. Just like privilege, implicit bias is not something that we ask for. It simply exists and it's up to us to deal with it. Understanding how and why implicit bias shows up in our lives is one of the steps to understanding how we have been impacted by the society in which we live. Implicit association and bias are, in some ways, illustrations of the wolves that live inside each of us. We're hardwired to see some ideas or people or things as good or bad, right or wrong, worthy or not. The bad wolf can be the feelings associated with others that are negative, or perhaps more commonly, the negativity we feel within ourselves. By recognizing these tendencies, we're taking a step toward improvement. We're moving to a better place. We're consciously reflecting on which ideals and values we want to encourage within ourselves. And in our choosing to feed the good wolf, we are choosing time and time again to change the wiring of our own brains. In Unitarian Universalism, our first principle affirms the inherent worth and dignity of every person, that every person is worthy of love and care, that every person is worthy of compassion, that every person is worthy of belonging, by affirming this, we are choosing again and again and again to say that every person is beloved. This doesn't mean that every behavior is right. It doesn't mean that every person can do whatever they want in our communities. It does, however, mean that every person is worthy of respect and dignity and that we acknowledge the many complexities of human nature. We live in a society that wants so badly for us to sort everything into categories. We're always being asked to decide if something is good or bad, right or wrong, happy or sad. And as human beings, our living reality is so much more complicated than that. Not only are our experiences so often a, mis a mixture of emotions, but our ability to definitively say that something is wholly good or wholly bad is diminished by the reality that life is more complex than dichotomies. This is particularly true when it comes to the idea of evil. We don't say much about evil. 
we'd much rather focus on the good, the honorable, the kind, the true. Our human nature suggests that by focusing on these good things, we can avoid the bad. We want so badly to believe that, to believe that if we do the right things and say the right things, we can avoid that part of us that says otherwise. We wanna say that, that right there, that's evil and I'm not that, so I must be good. We wanna separate ourselves from the ideas and behaviors that we have labeled for generations as bad and negative and unhealthy. But in doing so, we are denying that some of that lives within all of us. All of us have parts of ourselves that are angry and resentful and greedy and jealous. All of us have times when we feed that wolf. And maybe we do feed that wolf. We want to, and we do. And most of the time, we learn from the consequences of that action. We experience broken relationship. We feel separate from one another. We experience loss and pain. And all of us have the chance to do better, to choose better, to find a different way. If we acknowledge that things aren't always so easy to separate into good and bad, if we acknowledge that perhaps situations and people are more often a complicated mixture of the two, how does that shape the way we see the world? In our deep listening and tuning into the forces in our world that force us to choose between good and bad, how are we impacted and changed? Earlier, we learned a bit about one of the creation stories in the Hebrew Bible, the one that focused on creating order from chaos decluttering the world, creating its inhabitants. There's another creation story in the book of Genesis that focuses more on the human characters, Adam and Eve. This story has more to do with temptation, relationship, the impact of behaviors on how we see each other and the world. There are hundreds of creation stories that have shaped the world the dominant culture here in the United States and the cultures around the globe. For millennia, we have tried to understand how we got here, why we're here, what is the point, what is good, what is not, how to live a good life, what our relationship is with the rest of the world and whatever's beyond that in the universe. These have been the questions of humanity since the beginning of time. These have been the questions for which we have sought answers since the world was this formless void. They are questions that have shaped religions and the warring between religions and countries and tribes and entire continents. These are questions that have both inspired and threatened our minds and hearts since the beginning of time. Why are we here? What is the point? How do we make meaning? Making meaning amidst the realities of our lives is a lifelong challenge. Crafting stories that help us tell about the beauty and damage of the world is part of the challenge. Listening deeply and paying attention to the stories we've been told about ourselves and others our worthiness, our potential, our very nature is part of living an intentional life. Acknowledging that there is some good and some bad within all of us and ultimately choosing which wolf to feed. These are the tasks of humanity. In our listening deeply to the messages we receive about ourselves and each other, may we pay attention and strive toward understanding how they impact our associations and biases. In our thinking critically about the stories we're told about how the world is meant to be, may we ask important questions and seek out true answers. In our understanding of goodness and how it shows up in each of us, 
May we remember that we are each inherently worthy, even when that is hard to remember in the moment. There are days when our world feels once again like a formless void, chaotic and dangerous. There are days when we are reminded of the human tendency toward greed, hate and jealousy. There are days when we are challenged in our belief that all people have goodness inside them. On these days, when our ideals are stretched and challenged, may we be reminded of our own choice to be curious, to ask questions, to open ourselves to understanding and compassion. When we're feeling d despair or immense worry, may we remember that we are able to make choices in our own lives that will feed the good or the bad wolves within us, that we can only control what we can control and that we must continue moving forward. May we acknowledge the places and the times when we haven't been our best selves. May we acknowledge the chance we have to try again. May we acknowledge the power we have within ourselves and in community with others to shape the stories we believe about the world and our place in it. May we rail against the stories that try to tell us that some people are worthy and good and others are not including ourselves, including all of us. May we begin again in love. So may it be. Amen and blessed be. Which stories will you accept and which will you explore more critically? How do we make meaning in our lives of this chaotic world of our understandings about each other?
What does it mean to be good or bad? What does it mean to be both? These are the questions of humanity. Which wolf will you feed? We extinguish this chalice, but not the hope, love, and courage that it represents. We carry our love and our joy out into this beautiful and broken world. Our service has ended. Let our true service now begin. Go in peace. Thank you.